Hello everyone, welcome again uh, to this channel. This is Hybrid Accounts. Uh, if, you have, if you haven't subscribed, I suggest that you subscribe to that. And today we're just going to take a look at a statement of cash flows, but under the section of operating activities. You know, the statement of cash flows will incorporate operating activities, investing activities, as well as financing activities. Today we're just going to take a look at uh, only operating activities. So we look uh, at both uh, direct and indirect methods. So uh, stay tuned. So simply speaking, when speaking of operating activities, this includes uh, principal revenue producing activities of the entity and other activities that are neither investing nor financing activities. So it will be very obvious for actually operating activity, revenue producing activities, like let's say uh, I'm just selling books, the money I obtain, the, the, the revenue I obtain from books actually will be uh, under operating activities. It depends on the cash that I obtain from selling books. The cash I obtain from selling books will be under operating activities. But also everything that is not under investing or financing activities, as you saw in the previous lecture, will also be classified under operating activities. So why are operating active, why are cash flows from operating activities useful? You know, the cash flow of operating activities is positive. It means that the business is performing well. Actually, from the finance, from the investing side, the entity might have invested a huge sum of money to such an extent that actually the cash flow, actually the net cash flows is negative. But if the operating cash flows are is positive, it means that the entity had the capacity to generate cash flows that can be used to fund projects, but also as a source of investment. So. This is what our uh, operating activities uh, would actually show us. So you have to be very careful. All right, then we're told most of the components will be those which determine the net profit or loss. Of course, if you take a look at the income statement and the statement of profit or loss, you know, when preparing the statement of, of cash flows, you will be given, you are usually given two statements, the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, but also the statement of financial position. Now, from the statement of profit or loss, most of the items would be from would be forming part of operating activities, as we are just going to see shortly. All right. So let's just see examples of cash flows from operating activities. Actually, cash receipt from the sale of goods and the rendering of services that are usually uh, obtained from revenue. You would have them, and then. If you go back, if you go down the income statement, you'll find cost of sales. So cash payment to suppliers for goods and services. So all cash flows relating to revenue would stay in the operating activities. All payments relating to the cost of sales would also stay there, but also cash payments to, to, to and on behalf of employees, not just you and the behalf of employees, even for other operating activities, paying rent, things like that, would also be under operating activities. So uh, I could just show you something like this here, down here so that I get it more clear. But no problem. When dealing with direct and indirect methods, I'll depict all that, so don't worry at all. All right, here we're also given cash receipt from royalties, fees, and commissions. You know, it might arise that maybe you are an agent for someone. Someone has hired you to sell goods on their behalf that commission that you obtain is also classified under operating activities because it is usually added to revenue. So something like that, all right? Now, when, when, when dealing with operating activity, you would have two methods. You would have to choose between the direct and the indirect method. What are direct and indirect method when dealing with this situation here, all right? When speaking of the direct method, we, just, we simply mean top down. Top down, what do I mean by top down? You just go directly to the income statement. And if you take a look at the income statement, we usually start with sales. Then after sales, you have cost of sales. So when, when looking at the line of sales, you, come, you, you determine cash generated from sales. From the cost of sales, cash paid to suppliers. You go down to operating expenses, cash paid for operating expenses, maybe to actual employees, to for maybe for rent, things like that. You also have to account for all that. So that's what why you call direct method, that you start from the top and then you go downwards. That's why you say it involves disclosure of major classes of gross cash receipts and payments. But also we have the indirect method. 
when dealing with indirect method, no, it's reverse. That's why indirect method, by indirect method, we mean bottom up. By bottom up, that means you start from the bottom of the income statement. You start from the profit before tax, usually. If you start from the profit before tax, then you go upward, you make adjustments. That's why if you use the indirect method, we usually adjust because the pro you start with the profit that has been computed using accrual basis. But the cash flow, as I told you, just incorporates, uh, just attempts to show the cash that actually flowed to or from the entity. So that's what we deal with here. All right, so the net profit here would be adjusted for the following. Actually, I'll explain each and everything in an understandable way. So just stay tuned, All right? So the net profit is adjusted for three sections. You have to not usually have the three sections, but you will not have to memorize because it's very, very obvious when doing the questions. So we adjust for transactions of a non-cash nature. This is the first point. Adjust for all transactions of a non-cash nature. For example, let's say I deducted depreciation to arrive at the profit, then I would have to add back that depreciation. That's why I say non-cash nature like depreciation, for example. But also we adjust for working capital. When dealing with working capital, working capital simply means current assets minus current liabilities. So current assets could constitute inventory, trade receivables, while current liabilities could constitute trade payables. So I would also adjust for all that. Don't worry at all, we're just going to take a look at a very, very essential performer. And lastly, you adjust for non-operating items. You know, when speaking of non-operating items, there might be an item in the income statement, but it's, it's not concerned with operations. Let's say you have investment income. You have invested shares in a certain company. You have been paid dividends. So you have dividend income in your statement. Now, dividend income has been used to obtain profit for the year. So to adjust, to you have to eliminate it, and then you have to take it to the corresponding category, which with different received will usually be investing activities. So that's also a very, very essential point here. That's why we say non-operating items, items of income or expense associated with investing or financing cash flows, like investment income. So you have to note all that. All right, let's go down here and note this, and then we go directly to the performer because these performers are very, very, very important. So let's go directly here. Let's take a note here and then we will go to the performer. Now note what is superior between the direct method and the indirect method. The direct method is superior to the indirect method. Why? They actually give the same results on operating cash flows, exactly the same results. But what is the difference? You know, when dealing with the indirect method, the indirect method is generally concerned with the adjustments. You adjust the figures which you already have. But the direct method compute, let's say, like you see here, cash received from customers, cash paid to suppliers, which is usually not seen anywhere in the financial statements. So direct method gives you further information. So if you say cash received from customers, that means you can use this information to forecast uh, expected future cash receipts from customers in future years. So it's something like that. That's why we say the direct method is superior as it discloses information not available elsewhere in the financial statements, as you see here, which could be of use in estimating future cash flows. So it can be used in estimating future cash flows, but it might be difficult to obtain information about gross cash receipts and payments using the indirect method. So that's a very, very important point. That's why the direct method is presumed to be superior to the indirect method. Now it's time I'll go to the performer of direct method and indirect method. All right, now stay tuned.